Hello, everyone, and welcome to Weekly Manga Recap here on November the 29th, 2018, for the first time ever on November the 29th, 2018. I'm Nick, here with Chris, and we're going to talk about some manga today, I think. Yes. I don't know. I don't know what you have planned. That's what I was thinking we were going to do. Hmm. Well, I was going to start reading off recipes and just see if oh, people okay. cook them. So, like, mm. uh, eggs. Uh, I cap- sometimes cook cap- capers. very rarely. Well, Never I'm not. No, I'm asking. Capers. I'm asking people to cook with these right now, actively. So, oh, do them right now. Yeah, oh. I don't have a number. I don't know an order. I'm just saying capers, uh, eggs, vinegar. <laughs> Do you cook vinegar? <laughs> lemon juice. Just mix this shit together. See what happens. Oh, Probably gotcha. make something really good. Yeah. Um, a whatchamacallit bar. Uh, and Is that a real thing? Yeah. Whatchamacallit bar. It's a Hershey bar. It's, it's sort of like a smaller Hershey bar in terms of popularity. So I don't think it sees a ton of play outside of like the Pennsylvania area. Gotcha. It's, it's the scrum dim gumptious bar. Okay. Yeah, basically. I th- I'm trying to even remember what it is. It's basically like, hold on, what should we call it, bar? I remember there was like some sort of ice pop bar when we were young called like It's a Caduzzi. It's a Caduzzi. It was like a lemon bar that had like uh, cherry and I don't know lime like circling around it. Uh, this one was sort of like a rice crisp bar, essentially, with like chocolate uh, and like okay. a layer of caramel on it. And apparently, at some point, I don't even remember this, uh, in 2009, Hershey introduced the thingamajig, which was a chocolate version, essentially, uh, with like chocolate crisps and peanut butter instead of caramel. And uh, it is no longer in production. Gotcha. So Hershey should stop uh, making anything other than just Hershey bars, I guess. Yeah, yeah basically. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's Reese's. I could I could enjoy a good Reese, which is not the way you're supposed to say it, but <laughs> it's not very unnatural. I was almost like I was almost like I'm gonna take away your Pennsylvania fucking card at that point. You're like I enjoy a good Reese every now and then. <laughs> I too am a fan of the Iagulis. <laughs> Apparently, there's a Hershey chocolate called a Dagoba. Which, when I first saw it, I was like, isn't that the point that like Yoda hangs yeah, out Yeah, from you. <laughs> uh, it's apparently a premium chocolate. Anyway, I guess we actually eventually do have to talk about manga. Uh, right. It's good, to, it's good that we uh, managed to get that uh, delightful snack for all of our listeners to prepare and then have for themselves as they're listening to us, though. Yep. So thank you for that addition, Chris. Good job. We'll have a new recipe involving chili peppers and chocolate next week. Uh, so... To begin with, we're going to just talk about like manga this week. We don't have the recommendation done because reasons. Uh, so we are going to start by talking about uh, My Hero Academia, if you're cool with that. Sure. Why not? Why not? Why not? Chris, there's a bunch of people in Class B who we've never met before. Well, I think that we know o- Owase. I think he, was, he had a small role in the... Um, training arc thing in the woods like he grafted something he i think he grafted the tracker onto that nomu so that they could find bakugo so i know him Mm -hmm. i don't know any of these other people though apparently one of them is super important because she got like the other recommendation into the class uh tokage they're going up against team bakugo uh which is fair to call the team that he certainly acts like it's it's Team Bakugo because like he just is immediately like shouting at everyone to to keep up with him as he rushes through all the piping in this uh, arena that they're in. Uh, in fact, he apparently during their training session, refer, uh, not training session, but uh, during their preparation, well, before heading into this, called all of them minions. So there you go. Uh and of course, everyone's like, "That's this, your plan is stupid," and, and also stop calling us th- stuff like that. Be nicer to everyone. Uh, but Baku just says, "Like we're going to, we're going to keep have, we're going to just go straight into it." And Lobes here is going to track everyone with their ears so that we can uh, locate them because he still refuses to call anyone by their name. He's such a dick. Uh, at one point, uh, Jiro starts using her auditory senses to uh, sense around them and realizes that they've actually stumbled into a trap. Uh, 
Wait, uh, because hold on, Nick, you're saying in these big Class A versus Class B matches, uh, it starts with Class A walking into a trap because they don't, for some reason, know any of the quirks on the other team. Are you saying yeah, that you th- happened finally? You think you think that they would have done a little bit of research on their opponent at a certain point, but uh, no. Like after the first match, like wow, we really don't know any of their quirks, do we? Cons- <laughs> <laughs> like. <laughs> We thought, we always thought that it was just Bakugo who was the one who didn't care about anybody. But apparently, no, just we're just all ignorant assholes. <laughs> you think uh, fucking Deku would have like a notebook full of them? Just, yeah, I like, study everybody. Here's all of their quirks, and then they go in. If that's like, what happens in like the fifth and final match, he's like, "By the way, this is what everyone on the other team could do." <laughs> and everyone's like, "Wait, we could do that?" <laughs> I didn't. Oh, we can shit. Pay people other than ourselves. We can use knowledge of our opponents to come up with the strategy it's like that one scene in the simpsons where, where he has a conversation with his brain <laughs> what knowledge of other people can be used in, it can be used in combat how so <laughs> explain uh so it turns out that tokage uh she's a lizard girl because of in the sense of if a lizard chews off its tail or grows a new one she basically has captain buggy powers that is basically it uh she can divide her body up into up to 50 different pieces and just manipulate them freely and have them float through the air and what she had done was scattered them around an area to create a bunch of noise so that it lured uh, 1a into a trap and everyone else on her team basically strikes at once uh there's one guy who uh creates glue there's one guy who has claws who cuts down a bunch of debris to fall on them uh and so everyone's like well shit we're we're screwed. A bunch of rocks are falling and everyone's going to die. Uh, so Sato calls out to, uh, I believe he's referring to Bakugo and I guess, I guess Jiro. I'm not sure. He just says, he just says you two. He doesn't say who he's referring to, but uh, Bakugo is just to be like, yep, I'm out. Uh, and uses his explosion powers to jet himself uh, away from harm. Uh, and, uh, so everyone's like, all right, yeah, let's sell target Jiro cause she's the most troublesome one. And, uh, we'll start racking up points this way. But as Kamakiri, who has these claw things on his arms comes down towards her, all of a sudden Bakugo flies back in, blasts him in the face with an explosion, uh, while he's dropping down. And that's where the chapter ends. It's a very cool action shot, though. I do really like the way, the way that the everyone's posed out in the final image. Mm. Uh, I enjoyed this chapter a lot, if only because it ended essentially the way I wanted it to, which was like, it's almost like a parody of this arc to this point, where it's like, all right, let's go into this. And then it's like, oh, shit, we walked into a trap. And it's like, let's very quickly explain all the different powers of Team B, Class B, because they're new characters to us. Uh, but then in contrast to having it end on, like, a way where you're like, oh, what's going to happen next? Baku shows up and he's just like, fuck you, kaboom. And I just want that, <laughs> I want that to be the end of the fight. Like, I want him to have been like, oh, I knocked this dude out. And then he just walks over, does the same thing to the other two. And they're like, oh, shit, I guess fucking we shouldn't have had stupid what's-his-face back there doing nothing. Like, I, I feel like they're going to put a twist in here to make this, like, a suspenseful matchup. But I want none of it. I want Bakugo to just one-shot everybody. And he's just like, I get shit done! <laughs> it goes into the fifth match and uh shinso and everyone lays a trap for deku and company and then rise it looks like they're going to end one chapter on a triumphant moment bakugo comes in and blasts them all in the face he's like you you're know, not in this matchup what are you doing he's like shut up i get stuff done <laughs> <laughs> he's like you know what there's no incentive to lose or win so why don't we just win and knock them all out <laughs> uh yeah and uh, they do actually, you know, bring this into like, hey, character growth, because Bako has learned he can't do everything on his own. He's actually trying to protect his teammates uh, in doing this as opposed to just like, whatever, I'll just escape this trouble and then go back and blast everyone in the face. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, and that's it. It's a pretty quick chapter, uh, even when just like reading it as opposed to uh, summarizing it. So that's about all I got. All right, we are going to, I believe, move ahead to... I always get confused whenever Boruto gets added back into the mix, but I believe we're going to just roll it straight into Food Wars. Shokugeki no Soma. Mm-hmm. Last time Soma passed his match uh, with, you know, making a good 
you know, dish with shitty ingredients. Uh, apparently, um, Ramaru, the judge, uh, has given out too many high dollar awards in a row. So she's short on cash. So she just like digs through her pockets and gives uh, Soma $100. And it's like, you should be better prepared if you're going to do this, if you're actually going to give out money to people and it's got to be a minimum of $100 for them to pass, then what the fuck are you doing? I'm more curious. I assume it's because uh, the creative team doesn't know American currency very well. But how she's like, here's two bills, it looks like, and a couple coins of some kind. And two like, of them are clearly <laughs> two of them are clearly singles, too. Yeah, and you're like, uh, here you go. This, this should be a thousand this should give you a hundred dollars. I'm like, you realize all of our currency is less than one dollar, right? Yeah, it looks like she handed maybe like five dollars at most. If, uh, I, I, the, I, if the if the unless there's like two fifties under those two singles. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess there's what, two dollar coins? Or I know there's dollar coins. Maybe there's like a two. There's silver one. dollars. Yes. But but even if they do that, that doesn't like I don't know what <laughs> like combination they made to possibly make that. They're like that's just about a hundred dollars. I I mean like a hundred dollars stacked up in singles should be thicker than that. And the only currencies that you can the only denominations rather you can see there are single dollar bills. Mm. So. But yeah, she's got to go get some more cash and uh, yeah. Soma doesn't actually know how much his dish was actually worth. As a result of that, his uh, match against Tsukasa is um, basically a draw because, yeah. Basically. Oh, looks like we're getting a little bit of a rough from Nick here again. I wish I were you. Which, uh... So this has nothing to do with uh, the rest of uh, we don't get to see what Megami and uh, can do. Uh, great. It's just, I think it's just going to be my connection like yeah, tonight in general. I could take like 10 minutes resetting everything. But, uh. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll roll with it for a moment here. If, if need be, what we may do is just shut off the camera because it's probably throttling a little bit more. Okay. All right, let me see if I can uh, close a few things. Okay, so perfect. everything's perfect. <laughs> temporarily, yes. So the chapter title is I Wish I Were You. Chris, this chapter has nothing to do with Takumi and Megami getting to pass this uh, part of the test. Yay. Yeah, I made a joke last week about like, oh, and I'll bet they'll probably pass off like in a single panel. We don't even get that. They no. passed off screen. No. <laughs> we assume they don't actually even say they did. So we might come they in. They failed next right week. there. <laughs> they might. Yeah, they might have just failed. I don't know. Uh, Tsukasa and uh, Soma have a little bit of a conversation after uh, they pass. They go off and... It looks as though they've actually used the convenience store to get some actual, you know, snacks and stuff because Soma's snacking on like a popsicle of some sort. Uh, and uh, he just kind of observes like he didn't actually know what the hell the prize for the blue was. He just like joined it just because. Uh, so Ramara comes back and she um, is like, you, you seriously don't know what's at stake here. What the hell is wrong with you? Because the prize is an amazing prize. You get to you get to become the personal chef for the leader and prime adjudicator of the WGO, the bookmaster. And someone's like, why is that so great? <laughs> I do appreciate that. Like, there's not even a moment hesitation of like Soma being like, well, that's a shitty prize. <laughs> like, so, like, of course, Soma would be like, my prize is to cook for one person. Fuck that. That sounds lame. And she's and Ramar is like, it, no, they're a VIP among VIPs. Even adjudicators rarely get the chance to even see them. It's the chefs who pay for the privilege of presenting their dishes to such a grand and important person. And someone's like, oh, really? OK, <laughs> sounds stupid. I don't want it, but I want to I want to be the best. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's basically all that he says. Like, I'm just going to use use this contest to determine I'm the best. Meanwhile, uh, past the third gate. Uh, Arena has, you know, jumped the line along with, uh, fuck, I forget his real name, <laughs> Azami. Uh, Not Azami, that was his, uh, that was... As Asahi, isn't it? Asahi, god damn it. <laughs> uh, I'm confused because of his fake name. So Asahi 
who is also Saiba, who is also... Ah, so... He's got some random travel brochures while he's hanging around out with Arena. And she's like, why the hell do you have those? And he says, oh, well, there were a f- there was a mini mart on the way here, so I grabbed a few. So the, the freaking convenience store that they were in is actually stocked with, like, non-food items, too. I... Okay. I, I guess if you want to cook a travel brochure into your dish and uh, make that have it uh, well, have wanted, it cost more, they, because they wanted that. the authenticity where they're like, yeah, you walk into a convenience store and everything's really expensive and it's full of shitty magazines. I literally went into one today to pick up an energy drink, and the ugh, fuck, I'm trying to remember everyone involved with it. It was a National Enquirer that were like, oh god, it, it was like Goldie Hawn reveals like. It was like Charlton Heston on his deathbed revealed to Goldie Hawn about like an illegitimate child. I was like, who the fuck is reading this? Like, who are you trying to pull in? Like, who's still like waiting for the dirty Charlton Heston gossip that's out there? Oh, boy. Uh, so Erna is really is really upset with uh, with them hanging out with her and acting like they're friends and uh or rather her exact words are, you don't get to speak to me so casually. Asahi says, there's nothing casual about this. I call you princess. That's very respectful. And Arena's like, you fucking kidnapped me. How is that respectful? <laughs> um, but she's still far more tolerant of his presence than she should be, obviously. Uh, and uh, in order to, because she says, like, you're basically a stranger to me. And so he's like, OK, well, then if I tell you more about myself, then maybe we can be f- more familiar with each other. I and he starts giving I her got these scars. Yeah. He starts giving her his backstory, which she's very like, I don't know if I can even believe anything you say. Uh, and he's like, whatever, I'll just tell you. So I don't even know who my biological dad is. Uh, in the beginning, I just lived in my mom. I lived in uh, the northern United States in a slum. Uh, so Detroit. Uh, and my mom was a drunk and a fiend. And, uh, in order to try and get her to not drink whenever he was asked to bring her booze, he would try and give her water instead. But if she wasn't drunk enough, then she would waterboard him basically. Um, great family while screaming about how she wishes she'd never been born as well. Yay. Yay. So eventually Her alcoholism caught up with her and she died. So I got sent to an orphanage when when I was seven, I happened to meet him, Joe Ichiro. As part of a charity drive, a friend of his was running. He was going around cooking for orphanages. I'd never eaten food that warm, delicious before. Every time Joe came, I'd volunteer to help him cook. He'd take me to markets and fields and farms, get ingredients, send me on the path to become a chef. He pulled strings at local restaurants, gave me apprenticeships, taught me about French, Chinese, Italian, Japanese, all kinds of world cuisines. And it wasn't just cooking. We talked about all kinds of topics, and he taught me all kinds of things. I never told him this, but whenever I saw him, in my head I'd say, you're my real dad, Joichiro. And then when I turned 15, he just he couldn't come back anymore. And he says, my wife to Let her take care of some our son while it's not fair. I finally found my real dad. Don't steal it from me. Why couldn't I be you, Soma? Soma Yukihira. I wish I were you. And then he says he was just kidding. Indeed. Uh, just real quick. Turn off uh, your, your camera at this point. All right. Another one of those little pop in. So let's just try that and see if it helps. Can't hurt, I guess. So, um... That's basically the whole thing. Asahi uh, is so obsessed with Joichiro, uh, wants him to be his real dad so much that uh, he is obsessed with Soma and replacing Soma in Joichiro's life. And then he's like, ah, I'm just kidding. That w- Only a crazy person would say that. Yay. I'm a little like in a mind, like it's an interesting idea of like why Asahi hates Soma the way he does is because he's like, you essentially stole my dad from me even though he was your dad and if you're going to try to say the story of like oh well they're not actually it's not actually like an illegitimate child then i guess it's like the best way you could like justify why he feels so betrayed Mm -hmm. it works um 
I don't know. I'm still just like waiting for like I can't say more because he just gave like his whole backstory, but like mm-hmm. I think he and Soma just need more time interacting or something. And- like I like, I just feel like because if if the the part of the intention to this too is that he's like I want everything Soma has, so I'm gonna take Erina. It's like one it doesn't even make sense. Soma doesn't even realize he like he likes Erina at this point. Like. It's sort of like a weird thing, but that's where almost all of his interaction has been is with Arena at this point. Mm-hmm. Well, and I mean, if this is literally everything that we're getting about Asahi, then it's like, OK, but I think that you need to go further in order to justify why he is so insane and broken as opposed to just like, well, he had an abusive parent and then there was this person who was really nice to him. It's like, OK, but so what you're saying is just, he's just crazy then. Like, I mean, if they went the full gamut with that and he's completely ludicrous bonkers, that would actually kind of be an interesting story to tell. But I feel like it's just going to be like, no, he's just he's he's a bad guy, but he had a rough childhood. So it justifies it. And it's like it's a little lazy. Yeah. It's not enough. Yeah. Or just it just doesn't feel like it fits the tone of this series in a lot of ways. Hmm. Like you yeah, almost, especially that's like I'm going to I'm going to when he's got this bizarre eccentric mindset to him where he's like, and I'm going to marry Arena because like, OK, well, why do you want to do that? Then? <laughs> yeah, it's it's something where it just feels like certain pieces aren't adding up. We get a brief conversation between An and the bookmaster who says that the second gate trial is complete. Uh all of the noir have passed that have uh, gone through it, and about half of the traditional ones have failed at this point. Uh, the bookmaster says, now the true challenge of the blue will begin. Uh, everyone who has passed the second trial has through the gate. Uh, a bunch of noir are already waiting on the other side. And uh, some of the noir are say, like, I think that this time it's we, we should show them, and it will be a harsh lesson indeed just what sort of competition this year's blue truly is. Or that's not even some. That's not even the noir saying that. That's random people with fans. Okay. I think this is supposed to be the person. The I the, think that is the bookmaster. Yeah, yeah. Whatever their name is. I don't. I know we don't know their name, but I don't think we know their title either. Particularly, I don't care. Um, I will. I do want to point out Josh V in the chat mentioned a good point too. It all. Uh, honestly, he doesn't also have like his motivation doesn't seem to have anything to do with cooking whatsoever, which does feel maybe that's what it is that feels out of place like at least with azami you were like yeah his cooking philosophy is what contrasted with soma so much whereas with asahi it's just like it feels like there isn't that motivation in a cooking series Mm. so maybe maybe that's what's missing is it just feels like it's it's ill-fitting for that reason I think there's a bunch of problems with it in, it all in, in general just comes down to there's not enough yet to work with. So if this is literally all that we're getting, then it's like, OK, it doesn't it doesn't really ring very solidly right now. Mm-hmm. OK, so and then we are going to uh, move on to uh, Eden Zero. Yeah, let's talk about Eden Zero. Eden Zero, <sighs> Chapter 22, The Great Naked Escape. So, get an idea what this one's about. So, we start the chapter back with Hamora, I want to say is her name. That's uh, her name, she, yes. She's finished beating everybody, so she's like, is that the best you can do, mercenaries? My blade is not yet sated. Uh, and then we cut over to Wise, who, like I mentioned before, hang, was hanging outside, and I was like, is, that's kind of interesting. It's like a piece that you don't know what he's going to be doing. Kind of like, like, there's certain moments in One Piece where like Sanji's gone and like when he shows up again, he's done something pretty cool. And it's like, oh, because he's just kind of like that guy working in the background. Uh, we cut right over to Wise and he's like, what is she? Please tell me she's no psycho. Oh, but that's one nice backside, he says, referencing her ass. And I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> why is this what this series is? So, yeah, instead of doing doing something important, he was just hiding around the corner watching her fight and then checked out her ass as soon as he got a chance. It's it's yeah, there's a lot in this chapter. 
There's a lot. There's a lot. And I, and I found myself very irritated about the stuff that I really shouldn't, if only because I'm so, like, I'm just so frustrated <laughs> on the series as a whole. Because I sat here, I was like, this is stupid. Is this his character trait? Is Weiss supposed to be a weird, creepy asshole? Or is this just Hero at this point? Like, I can't <laughs> tell anymore. It's it's one of those things where we've gotten over 20 chapters into this and it's been such a constant thing over the last couple of months that it's just kind of grinding us down. <laughs> so we cut over to uh, Eliga's headquarters or whatever it is. And uh, what's what's their name? The bounty hunting or the hunting gang they hired. Oh, the something zero, wasn't it? Or. Ah, fuck, I can't remember what their name is. Uh, but they're they're there. Rogue they're, something. Oh yeah, like rogue butt or something. I don't know. <laughs> rogue something. Uh, they're there and they're like, "Hey, we gave you twenty nine girls, so at least pay us for that." And they're like, "No, uh, Aliga does not want to encourage people to make uh, to get paid by uh, paying for shoddy work. So we're not going to rogue out. That's it. Uh, we're not going to pay you for that." And they're like, "But this is." stupid we delivered 29 of them you're not just going to get to keep all 29 girls and pay nothing uh then sister shows up and she's like i will settle this moscoy and this is like the little fucking sumo guy is right she's talking to uh that's kind of weird actually because oh no she gets out of the ship and the members of uh fucking rogues one comment on it sorry i thought uh Jin in the back was sister for there for some reason so they sister arrives we cut up to the top of the ship where shiki's hiding out and she looks down and he sees Jin, and he's like ah it's him and he's like yeah and i'm gonna get back Re- Re- rebecca or is it lucy no lucy was the last series this was rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Jin has a moment where he turns he thinks he senses something but he doesn't see Shiki because he's gone and this is the moment I wanted to comment on because sister's like Moscow return to headquarters you should be able to to find some human bodies that are in HQ so make preparations to remodel them and Moscow's like yes big boss and then he starts doing the the fucking uh, like thousand hand slap like he Honda does and for some reason that gives him flight Yes. Two people are like, how does that work? No idea. (laughs) And I I sat there and I was like, Hero, you have all of space to take advantage of. (laughs) And you gave up this quickly. I don't don't fucking know. (laughs) I don't know why this bothers me so much, but you have all of space and technology to work with. And you sound like, wouldn't it be funny if he did the thousand hand slap and just flew off into space? And he's like, yeah, sure. Fuck it. I don't even well, take does... advantage of the new like, cosmos I have to work with. How does that work in terms of in terms of space travel? Oh. I don't know. Maybe he can go anywhere he wants by just hopping everywhere with his fucking thousand hand slap, I guess. Anyway, we cut back inside of the base and Rebecca's there and she starts talking with the... Uh, the one girl with tattoos who's who's commenting on like, you know, my YouTube channel was always or sorry, B-Cube. My B-Cube channel was always about going into dangerous territory and all that sort of stuff. And Rebecca's like, yeah, I watched all of it. It was really intense. She's like, no, it's all been scripted. It's all fake. I've never been anywhere dangerous in my life. And everyone's like, what? I had no idea. Wow. And I'm like, not one of you. <laughs> like it's one of those things like when you create content and at any yeah. point you start to realize like oh a lot of these things i watch yeah there's a lot of there's a lot you once you start to have to do it yourself you realize that a lot of it is just like little tricks that are not as difficult as they initially seem a lot of it is a lot more difficult than it seems but mm-hmm. some of it is not so yeah and they're all like wow but this basically just means that tattoo girl is very very scared and <laughs> And she's a phony chris yeah what a big fat phony uh she should be ashamed of herself what a fraud mm-hmm. i'm glad you're gonna get turned into furniture for the rest of your life <laughs> uh and she's she really she doesn't want to die so rebecca pulls everybody together and a little girl mentioned something and she's like what do you think these bubbles are essentially what they realized they're like the bubble eats all of our clothes but doesn't affect our skin however it eats glasses as well like it I guess he doesn't want any accessories on the girls. So 
And in all their like jewelry and glasses and everything else like that. There's a scene of like the one girl trying to eat it as well, but whatever. They realize like, okay, if it eats glass, there's a glass window up there. So how are we going to get up there? Well, there's 29 of us, so let's form a pyramid. So they do. And I was very annoyed at this because they formed the pyramid. And I was like, why is Rebecca at top? Oh, God, please don't tell me they forced that poor 12-year-old girl to be part of the pyramid. They did. <laughs> no, 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 well, she's, no, they didn't. Or, well, well, they did, but they say why, at least. Which yeah. is, I'm scared of heights, so I have to be on the bottom. <laughs> it's like, that doesn't even, I mean, it's brutal. <sighs> Anyway, there's also a moment where one of the it's girls is disgusting. like, oh, man, I bet we get a lot of views if someone saw all of us like this from behind. And I'm like, I'm glad we can get some comedy out of our bending the like fucking future in servitude. But whatever. Uh, the pyramid falls, but Rebecca got up and she breaks through the window and she sneaks out. And it's like a very big thing of like, OK, cool. She's going to help us get out of here. Nope. <laughs> Well, there's also like six fucking jokes at the one girl. It's it's so stupid. It's like if I do it four more times, the fat character wanting food will be funny. Yeah. And it's just like uh, it's the lowest common denominator on fucking everything this week. So Rebecca gets out and she's she's going through the fucking vents when all of a sudden a tongue grabs her and the Liga pulls her out of the vent. And he's like, oh, Wow. You're how did you get out? And then he goes on a long fucking rant about why he's evil. And it's the most fucking baseline reason why anyone would be evil. He's like, I'm wealthy and thus I can do evil things. And there's nothing more interesting to him than that. He's just a freaky, dirty dude. And he talks about how, well, you escaped. So now I'm going to make you my personal pet. And he starts like licking her with his tongue. And it's really creepy. And it's really annoying. And then Shiki shows up and kicks him in the face. And that's how the chapter ends. And I'm so fucking tired of this garbage, Nick. I'm so tired of it. I don't get why she had to escape if Shiki was just going to show up and rescue her anyway. It's it's such an annoying moment when you're like, okay. I can recognize probably what will end up happening is like Shiki will maybe end up fighting Jin. And maybe Rebecca will get a chance to, like, kick a Liga's ass at some point. Cool. Great. It was much more significant if Rebecca could have escaped on her own instead of having to be saved from this situation. Like, it's already so weird and uncomfortable that it just adds, like, an extra layer onto the stuff that's like, why does everything have to be the lowest common denominator in this? Why does everything have to be as simple and straightforward and predictable as possible? Like... Nothing interesting happens here. Aliga is just a creepy, weird pervert. There's nothing more interesting than that. There's girls who are worried they're going to be sold, like they're going to be frozen as furniture for the rest of their lives, and they're making jokes about their own asses. And you're like, like, come on, man. I'm, I'm just so fucking tired of this. I mean... When it when the first time the chapter basically boiled down to this was so long ago at this point, this series has been going on for less than half a year, and it feels like it's been eons of this because he just keeps doing the same thing. It's really, 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 really tiring. I, I think what may, really annoys me is that, like, it just feels like there's no point to anything, like. None of this enhances Gilst as a world because there's nothing about Gilst in this environment. There's nothing mm -hmm. about how this is a giant place, like a giant city on giant tree drops. Like the setting takes no point into this. And I mentioned before, it, it bothers me so much that Hero took a new series into space and it's completely indiscernible from his series about magic that we like experienced before. Like. There's nothing really different going on. Every so often we see a slightly different kind of humanoid alien. I guess in this case we have the giant frog alien. But, like, all of the girls who were kidnapped are normal human people. All of the, like, techniques shown seem pretty equatable to the magic we experienced in Fairy Tale. It's just, it's just the same thing again. And it's, it's so annoying when it's like, 
I don't know. Like, I, I guess it's just something where I'm like, I want something more from this. Like, I'm, I'm tired of this baseline stuff being acceptable and just being something to digest each week. Like, it's not so offensive. I'm like, I don't want to read this anymore. But it's just exhausting after a while to be like, really? Like, you, you have cool concepts at points and you just never follow up on any of them. It's just always the same shit. Yep. I'm very tired, Nick. Very okay. T- very tired of reading this. <laughs> All right. Uh, Great chapter. My favorite of the week. <laughs> let's, talk, let's talk a bit about Boruto, Chris. Because uh, there is a Boruto chapter this week. It's uh, continuing to follow Kawaki, house guest. Uh, so last time, the one member of the one organization... Am I still connected? Yeah, I'm, I can see you here. Oh, okay, okay. Because I thought I heard you say something for a minute. Uh, I'm good. Okay. So, the one member of the one organization with the mask, he last time ended the chapter by uh, going into uh, Konoha's barriers uh, after saying, you can't go inside of their barriers unless you have a special thing like I do. And Delta's like, what the fuck? All right, fine. And uh, she thinks to herself, I wonder how he how he, Koji managed to do that. And he just thinks to himself as he's walking down the streets with a hood up, because that is how all unnoticeable, unimportant people uh, dress with, and a, with and dark. A mask as well. Yeah, no one will ever take a second look at that guy. Uh, he's like, this is my mission, Delta. I shall do as I please. And he's got a little all black frog hanging out on his waist. Like the frog is incognito, too. Which I think lends credit to my theory that Koji was originally from Konoha. Oh, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, I don't think. I mean, like obviously Jiraiya and you know Naruto and them were uh, from Konoha, but who knows what connection to like the frog sages and stuff actually has to do with it. So, uh, so. Kawaki is looking at the super glue that Boruto gave him because he's like, Ooh, fix the fix the boss that Himawari made that you broke. And he's like, mm-hmm. uh, Naruto asks Boruto to go uh, spar with him, and uh, Boruto's like, well, I guess I can see if uh, if it, if I've got an opening in my schedule. Uh, I was just going to play this game uh, on this piece of not technology. Uh, and he more is like, you're happy that your dad's spending time with you. He's like, oh, no, sure. <sighs> like, I mean, it, there's really no point in denying it. That was your entire character for the entire first <laughs> chapter of this story. <laughs> uh, and, and Naruto also says, like, hey, Kawaki, come with us. And, he's, and Kawaki's like, can I keep putting my cheek on my fist like this if I go? Because I don't want to do another pose in the entire rest of this chapter. They're like, we can change it slightly to a similarly brooding stance. Ah, uh, this is this falls within acceptable parameters. Kawaki shall join you. <laughs> you refer to yourself as a third person. Kawaki refers to himself as many things. He is an agent of darkness and thus has no true name. And I like oh, oh fuck have- you're an idiot. <laughs> We have to start. We have to start establishing a new arrogant character because hashtag Ray's only got so many chapters left. So. <laughs> you know, he does feel like he would be a lot like Ray. Just look at his hair. I mean, yeah. come on. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'm very cool. I wear a sleeveless shirt and I shave the sides of my head. <laughs> All right, guys, we've gotten set for our new Naruto RPG. Emma, what are you going to do? I got. I decided to make uh, a character who is uh, Sasuke and and, and uh, Sakura's daughter, and she's got a lot of identity issues, but she really wants to be helpful to everyone, like the like uh, the current Hokage Naruto. All right, uh, what are you going to do, uh, Norman? I'm going to make a guy named Mitsugi, uh, and he's just not going to show up very often, so I can just piece out a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, perfect, fits your character exactly. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, and Ray, what did you guys decide to do? Do you want to play the main character, Boruto? No, I've decided that I'm going to be Kawaki, and he's like Boruto, but he's also the dark anti-hero character, like like Sasuke. Like, and he hangs around all the time, and he's got a cool haircut, and he... <laughs> like, it's that moment of, like, what character are you played, right? And he's like, ah as he's his scroll <laughs> he of his character. Unfurls his scroll. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, 
So Kawaki is not a human being the way we traditionally know. He's somewhat of a ex- science experiment abused by the powers that made him, but it only made him stronger. They didn't realize they were creating their own worst enemy. <laughs> Ray, how long is this backstory? We want to get started today. And the worst part is, he doesn't have baby memories, you guys. <laughs> they took those away. They took away his baby memories. <laughs> So he, oh, he swears vengeance against the people who took away his past, meaning his favorite memories. Well, what's his ninja skills? He actually doesn't think a ninja is that cool, except for the one technique that is kind of cool. He likes that one. But otherwise, he thinks ninjas are kind of he's, boring. He's a he's ninja, just but he doesn't use ninja skills. <laughs> he's special like that. Also, he's level 17. Nimre, we agreed level 3. I can't draw the cool stuff I want at level 3. I'm level 17. <laughs> God, why did we invite you? <laughs> and then and then they're like okay i guess we need someone to t- i need we need someone else i guess to play the main character phil what are you up to <laughs> oh so i'm gonna play the character i'm gonna play him as an absolute shithead that's fine whatever <laughs> gonna go, go to training that's, today that's fine. we'll treat them as character flaws <laughs> yeah they're like you want to go to training today uh, maybe I'm going to make some time in my busy schedule of sa- helping mario save the mushroom <laughs> kingdom <laughs> <laughs> give give that peach a one four when he's done. Bitch, save your own kingdom. God. All right, we'll just we'll just have Burrow to interact with female characters as little as possible. <laughs> that sounds like a plan to me. I wouldn't have it any other way. Emma, what's your special ninjutsu skill? Is it sandwich construction? <laughs> They're like, yeah, I don't think there's gonna be a big love interest angle this this arc. <laughs> So anyway, no, Boruto starts sparring with his dad, and he almost immediately uses Kage Bunshin uh, Shadow dop- Doppelganger Jutsu, and this and Kawaki's like, "Oh, whoa!" Um, and uh, so they start fighting with like three Boruto's to one uh, Naruto. Uh, Naruto's still very much holding his own uh, despite this. Uh, and Naruto, you know, he, pl- he engages him some, uh, you know, in some banter. So he's like, hey, I thought you said you weren't going to hold back. Come on. Uh, so Kawaki's like, you should quit it with the petty tricks. Use karma. And in order to kind of force him to do it, he activates his own karma. And of course, this causes Boruto's karma to act in response. Uh, and so then he's like, yeah, come on, you know, this increases your physical abilities, you get stronger, so take advantage of it and practice with it. Naruto is actually encouraging of this because he says, if you're going to end up having to use this ability in combat, you might as well actually practice with it as opposed to experiencing it in the, for the first time in the middle of combat. So making the most of his shitty interference. Uh, they spar some more. Uh Naruto is pushed slightly harder uh, because Boruto is stronger. Seemingly, he uses the shadow uh, doppelganger to counter a lightning technique that Boruto uses. He basically just has uh, some of the shadow clone to take the blow instead. And there is a really weird moment where Naruto uses his super speed, appears behind Boruto and says, it's not just your power or speed, but the strength of your jutsu is also greater. And then Boruto says in response, you're behind me. Yes. <laughs> he said a whole paragraph while he was behind you. <laughs> he gives like a small mini speech. And that's what Boruto's like. Aha, caught you. <laughs> Think you can hide yourself from me. Well, I have sensed your presence. <laughs> and of course, hashtag Kawaki is like, too slow, stupid. <laughs> And yeah, Naruto kicks him in the back of the fucking skull and and wins the and wins the sparring session. <laughs> so I, I like how he's just like, you've gotten stronger, and I was like, has he? <laughs> like, hard to tell. It when feels you're like this wasn't stopping him so bad. It feels like this wasn't even as clever as like the effort he put up when they had that ma- like that exhibition match where he like they demonstrated like the fake arm technology and everything else like that, like. It feels like it wasn't that much more impressive than that in any way, but Naruto is still like, wow, you're really impressive. I'm like, uh, sure. So then they do the whole, like, pinky swear thing that uh, Naruto and Sasuke did at the end of their fight, where they go like, mm. And so Kawaki's like, what's that? It looks weird. 
why are they doing some sort of stupid picky swear thing? And Himawari explains that it's the unison sign. It's like when Taya got everyone to put their hands in a circle and drew a smiley face on their hands. It's a bond of friendship thing. My favorite character was Merrick. <laughs> of course it was. You want to know why I but, liked him? Because he why? had scars on his back and he was trouble. Because he had scars on his back and he was tr- Shut up, you don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> because he could use his million rods to control people's eyes. Because he could use it. Fuck you. <laughs> you don't know me. You're not my mom. You know, you know, his deck sucked dicks, you know, right? <laughs> you know that, right? No, you just need a, the appropriate sideboard to counteract any strategy you come up with. I mean, that's true for any deck. I mean, it's not like his is the only deck that has access to a sideboard. It could be. What were those like golden handcuff things that he summoned the most useless monsters everywhere just so that ever so that just so that he could have Maya be kind of BDSM? Shut up. It was cool. Yeah, it was very dark and edgy. It, it informed a lot of my childhood. Now shut the fuck up or I'm going to put you in Lava Golem's cage. All right. Lava Golem is a fantastic card that is unappreciated. It's time. It is an amazing card. He did not, Merrick did not build a deck around it, though. <laughs> he was just like, here's a 3,000 attack monster. Like, do you want to, like, immediately sacrifice it to, like, deal damage to everybody? No. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> and it deals even less damage to you than it does in the original game. <laughs> anyway. Amar says that the pinky swear thing is a shinobi ritual, a salutation that you do at the end of a match. So Kawaki's like, OK, and then he has a flashback to when he was being drained by his weird foster father guy who was like, come on, use your karma. Otherwise, you're worthless to me. And Kawaki's like, I'm done with this bullshit. I'm going to go play video games. Uh, and he says, like, oh, well, it seems as though you still have lots of energy. Now get up. You have nothing. You have no family, friends, power, talent, video games. You don't have a single thing. You are empty. And more than anything, you loathe your empty self. You deny your own worth. There is a hole in your heart. Nothing you gain will ever fill it. It'll just spill right out of that hole. But I have bestowed karma on you for that reason, because it is a special mark that is the only thing that can fill your punctured heart. He's like finally puts the script away for this long ass speech that he had ready for for this moment. It's so fucking poetic. Who talks like this? I I really I feel like when it comes to Kawaki, if you just replace lyrics around him with lyrics from like Papa Roach, it feels just as like easily like fuck it. Like it just makes as much sense as it does otherwise. <laughs> Come on, life into pieces. I've reached my last resort. Suffocational breathing. <laughs> I tear my heart open. I sew myself shut. My waker says that I care too much. <laughs> so goddamn emo. Uh, I, I think that, like, in reality, this guy had actually just said, like, listen, Kawaki, you are worthless and you have nothing. And because of that, you hate yourself. That's why I've given you karma, because that will that is the only thing that can give you worth, which will thus allow you to become my tool. And instead, Kawaki gave him this long speech in his head that made it sound way cooler and darker and and uh, more poetic. Yeah, like like if you go back to the actual moment, the dude was just like, you're kind of shitty and worthless. And that's why you have any value to me whatsoever. And in Kawaki's mind, he's like, you, you're you're a hole with nothing in it. Too dark to understand. So powerful and interesting. <laughs> he's just like, you're right. I am dark and powerful <laughs> and interesting. Now I'm going to go sit somewhere with one knee propped up so I can put my elbow on it. Hmm. Oh. Brooding. <laughs> well, you're so cool, Kawaki. I love all the stances you take. But I will Guys, look, look at this. Look at this. Bad backstory. Guys, look at this picture of Kawaki that I had drawn for my character sheet. I spent five hundred dollars on the commission. <laughs> Why is he a wolf? Don't judge me. It, I mean, it looks like they just like sketched it out and didn't really put a whole lot of effort to it. And also, the design is really like this design is to my exact specifications. How dare you? <laughs> I emailed my commissioner back seventy nine times to get make sure that this sketch came out the way it did. <laughs> no, not dark enough. Not edgy enough. <laughs> <laughs> that made up. Oh, my- so so you gave them five hundred dollars because you needed them to make a hundred drafts. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> the person's like, yeah, ninety eight percent of the responses back were not edgy enough, not dark enough. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I was like eyebrow piercings. <laughs> Never. So. <laughs> 
to stop eating meat. It's always all caps, too. <laughs> he doesn't actually have, a, a, like, a caps lock key on his keyboard. It was hit once and ripped out. <laughs> He's like, this is how all my appendage have been understood. I said, uninstall the caps lock key now that it's done. It's useless to me now. <laughs> Why do I ever want to disengage it? You won't so... hurt anyone else now. <laughs> He's <laughs> pouring glue over the key. <laughs> so, Ray, you ruined your whole keyboard. <laughs> ruined or perfected. So it's actually, instead of not edgy enough, it actually read like, because he could only hit like three of the keys. He just put emojis. So he just has like the one emo emoji over and over again with a bunch of plus signs next to it. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> Kawaki talks with Naruto when they get back home, and Naruto, because uh, uh, Kawaki asked him, like, "Hey, when you were having that sparring session, it seems like you were having fun." And Naruto's like, "Yeah, do you want to try doing nin- ninjutsu training with me?" And Kawaki's like, "I'm not a ninja. I can't wield chakra or whatever you call it. I'm just an awesome fighter without chakra. That's what makes me so special." And Naruto says, like, oh, but chakra is not just the tool of the ninja. Chakra is a force that surrounds us and penetrates us and binds us all together. This is literally like the force speech from Star Wars. Like, tell me I am wrong. (laughs) No, you're right. I do appreciate, though, because this is essentially what Naruto learned by the end of the original series. Is He's like, oh, well, chakra is actually something that everybody has. And it's sort of a thing that's supposed to keep us all together. And. And war is bad and all that sort of stuff. And like Kawaki's takeaways, he's like, so I could make clothes of myself because the only worthy opponent I'll ever have is me. He's like, I mean, I guess. Sure. Why not? <laughs> cool. And Kawaki says like he also also implies that he wants to beat the crap out of himself. Uh, and Naruto is like, well, if you did that, you wouldn't feel any better. Because, I mean, I've actually tried that. And I, so I have proof. And Kwok is like, what are you talking about? You're fucking weird. Uh, but he just says, like, look, it's better if you just fight an opponent as long as it's a worthy rival. Friendship can change the world. Look at this picture. Look at this photograph. Every time I do, it makes me laugh. Nickelback, you're so corny. <laughs> anyway, time to listen to The Last Resort by fucking Papa Roach again. You, she loves have, me not. She loves me not. <laughs> haven't you heard of the great American band Stained <laughs> and all their <laughs> classic hits? Like, uh, hold on. I'm, try- <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's one outside. Hang of on a second. I'll think of a Stained song eventually. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I need something harder than it's been a while. But is there? <laughs> Fucking uh, trapped. Headstrong. They're my favorite. <laughs> Kawaki seemingly decides to go and finally glue the stupid fucking Voss back together. Uh, and as he does, the frog that with, was with Koji is spying on him. And apparently Koji can like see through its eyes or something like that. Because like, ah, oh, I found you. So there you go. I'm trying That's to, the chapter. I'm trying to think of like a really shitty song that Kawaki hums to himself all the time. And I'm like, he wouldn't do... I mean, maybe he would do P.O.D. Youth of a Nation like, just in his head all the time. But I feel like there's a douchier song. Oh, it, oh, he's probably everywhere he goes. He's like, he's picking up the trash. He's like, I heard a birth about you. Oh, I do. I love you. <laughs> and he's like, now <laughs> it was like, God damn it. Someone destroy that shithead fucking CD player. <laughs> If you're going to go with Three Days Grace, there are even songs that they do that are better than that. Come on. <laughs> He's like, no, the song encapsulates everything that I'm about. I hate you, and I hate everything about you. But I, for some reason, I love you. See, it makes me complicated, too. <laughs> I have layers, like an onion. <laughs> but onions are stupid, and I don't like them in my food. <laughs> I only eat pizza and chicken fingers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anyway, Chris, let's move on to the next series. We never learn. Uh, do we have to? Yes. All right, fine. I'm in this series, too. I made an OC for this one. <laughs> he wait. sees the poetry in mathematics. <laughs> math is poetry. What's your grade in math? A D. 
but a D is kind of like a zero, so it's the most poetic grade to get in math. <laughs> uh, no, this is question 89, the star of Ultimate Love and the Name of X Part 5. So we've had quite a long little journey here. Yes, we have. This, this storyline has been going on for a month. Yeah. So. so we are <laughs> picking up as we left off last time was uh, Fumino basically turning the laptop to her father and saying, let's ask mom what she thinks about all this. Uh, and then we, we start this chapter by going back into the flashback that preceded that mm. as the two of them are holding hands, uh, Fumino and Uega. And she's, uh, you know, he's like, Oh, I shouldn't have grabbed your hand. I'm sorry. I, I got a, it got carried away. And she's like, no, it's fine. You remind me of my mother's hands. As we go back to a flashback within a flashback of Firmino's mom saying, Firmino, what would you do if you find a new star? What will you name it? And then we cut into the current. I guess what is the current, which is Firmino turning the laptop to her dad. And he's like, I told you to never touch that computer besides her research. And Firmino's like, there's no research. There's a single file on there. And he's like, huh, what? A single file? How'd you know the password? Her research, huh? And uh, we see the file starts playing. And it's of Fumino's mom as she's in the hospital. Uh, and she has this moment where she's just like, huh, what's this do? Uh, when's, when's it record? Oh, shit, it's on. Uh, and she says, uh, hey, I hope the two of you are taking good care of each other. And I guess if you're watching this video, then everything's okay. Uh, three things I'd like to apologize for. First, I said I was saving my research paper dealing with the Millennium Prize problem on this computer, but... I kind of lied. <laughs> that thing's really, really hard, and I couldn't solve it. Uh, and then, but you're a genius! <laughs> she's like, yeah, not really. Second apology, I know I was kind of like always labeled a genius and everything, but I was honestly really terrible at math until high school. And I guess she just has these on her, but she has a bunch of like math tests from her high school where she got really mm -hmm. shitty grades. Yeah, uh, and she kind of points it out, and she's like, "Yeah, you know, at first I just wanted you to see me at my best, Ragey, and I loved it when you complimented me. Uh, but and the harder I worked, the better my results came out. So that's kind of what happened. I really just wasn't good at math until I got into high school, and that's around the same time we met. So she kind of encourages her daughter by saying, "If you ever struggle with something, don't worry. I know better than anyone what it's like to struggle in school. Just go after what you really love and give it everything you got." And we cut away. This this is a really interesting chapter because we're cutting all the fuck over the place throughout it so we cut over to after everything has happened as uega is like outside Fumino's place like a cop's trying to be like stalkers always say that their their friend lives here i'm taking you away to club prison where we club people he didn't say all this but i'll, I'll imagine the backstory for him uh, Firmino stops and is just like, hey, I I'm not actually a police officer. I just like pretending to arrest people so that I can abduct them and beat them with my club. They're going to make a movie out of me one day. You hear it'll be called Club Club. <laughs> I'm a great with words. <laughs> uh, so Firmino's like, hey, I told you I'd call you when I was done. So you didn't have to come here. And you're just like, I was just worried. So is everything OK? He was like, I don't know. We cut back inside. <laughs> As the rest of the video continues to play, and this is before Firmino's mother could get to that third apology. I think the idea here is that it's this already is finished, I think. Slap that he's rewatching it. Yeah, he's so. rewatching it, I believe. But we still haven't, as an audience, heard the right. third apology or anything yet. So before she can even get to it, Fumino in the video, when she's still a child, is like, Mommy, mommy, you promised we'd look at stars together today. And she's like, Oh, is it time already? Well, we're gonna if we're gonna find one today, you'd better think of a name. What will you do, Firmino? If you find a new star, what will you name it? Like we heard earlier in the chapter. And Firmino, as a child, says, Ragey. And Firmino's mom's like, Daddy's name? How come? Why not mommy's name? And she says, Well, you and me are gonna find it together, mommy. So we have to name it after the person we both love the most. And you're like, Oh, that's fucking heartbreaking. Yeah. <laughs> So, as it turns out, the answer to the password was Reiji. And Fumito even says, like, yeah, it's ironic. If we'd been talking to each other, we would have figured it out right away. But it took ten years. And then Fumino starts thinking about the third apology that she heard before. So we go back to what her mom is saying in the video and saying, oh, I almost forgot the third apology. I'm sorry. I'm afraid my absence will be very hard on you both. But I hope 
that just like I achieved so much with Reiji's wonderful support, I hope one day, Fumino, that you'll meet some, someone wonderful like that, too. And the video ends, and we can see her father staring at, like, the, the play again screen, and he's kind of hanging his head in shame. And then we cut over to Fumino, who's answering her mother by saying, yes, don't worry, mother. And uh, Yuika's just like, did you say something? She's like, no, but thanks for all your hard work uh, and all your support. He's like, ah, it wasn't anything, anything at all. She starts resting her head on his shoulder. And he's like, huh? I like because he says this out loud. He's like, huh? She must have fallen asleep again. Man, she's been working so hard. And then Firmino's like, no, I'm awake. And he's like, uh, uh. And she's like, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll move my head in a second. But can we just stay like this a little while longer? It's a very cute scene. Yeah. Later on, I don't know if it's supposed to be the next day or some other day, but it's the... It's uh, at night still. <laughs> it's the next parent-teacher conference day. We see that Firmino was joined by her father and that he decided to support her choice in school. And this is, again, where I'm like, this is such a weird chapter in the way it paces itself. I love it, but it's like, after this, Yuega's like, oh, hey, by the way, my mom told me a story. Flashback to another moment where Yuega's mom was talking with... Uh, Firmino's father and he's like hey I'm apologizing for all the trouble my daughter's putting you through here's some money to make up for it uh, and how is she doing I actually you know what I have, I have no right to ask about that and Yuega's mom's like you know on the day of the conferences you talking to Ogata was an excuse wasn't it you were actually planning to attend your daughter's conference I can I can see that you actually care about her so why won't you let her see it and uh, Reiji says long ago when I lost my wife I hit my daughter for no good reason, and I'm ashamed to say ever since, I, I haven't known what to do. I've never thought of anything besides math, and I have no idea how to interact with my daughter. And this is kind of the only, like, weak part of the chapter in my mind, because there's not really a conclusion from here. Like, that sentiment is exchanged, and there's a little bit of, like, okay, so that phone call he received, yeah, it was probably your mom that did it. And then Reiji shows up and is like, are you talking about me? And they're like, uh, what are you, you shouldn't be here. And he's like, Naruki Yuega, what is your relationship with my daughter? And then there's a bunch of wackiness, and that's a chapter. <laughs> like, it's weird that there's so much emotion to this chapter, and there's not, like, like, it still ends on, like, the classic fucking, mm -hmm. we never learned, like, one panel, like, mm -hmm. dialogue gag. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely the weakest part of the chapter. I think there's a lot of good stuff in this. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do really like that it's revealed that, like, yeah, Reiji just doesn't fucking understand people, apparently. Uh, he didn't even understand his own wife, uh, in truth. Um, I think that that in the end it goes a little bit easy on him because he's just like, I didn't know what to do after I hit my daughter. It's like, well, you kind of need to figure that out, dude. Uh, but... I do really like the way that this results in a nutshell mm -hmm. um, in isolation, I should say. And uh, it seems as though we're getting much stronger, like Fumino realizing that she's got something for Yuiga in this. There was a lot of bonding that they did in this series, in this sequence. So I think that if you were going to make a reason for why Fumino might, because the whole thing is that she she kind of understands she might have something for Uega, but she realizes she can't pursue it because her two friends, like, have openly kind of, like, she knows that they have feelings for Uega, so she doesn't want to screw with that. But having her go through this entire kind of sequence, and again, th like, this is the first time we've had, like, a really long arc that's been centralized on one character like this. So having this whole ordeal with Uega at her side kind of gives you a reason to be like, okay, like... I don't know if she's necessarily still going to start actively pursuing it, but I could definitely see this being a huge step forward towards that. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. I I like the way they handled everything with Reiji. I, I think there's still time to continue developing this. It'd be different if like it just ends and everything's perfect between them. But I think this is the way to show like there's still steps to be had, but saying like, Hey, your dad's not like an evil person. He's just made mistakes and it seems like he wants to try to make up for them, especially after right. seeing what your mom had to say. It's, it's just, uh, it's a very sweet sentiment, a little bit 
is contrived in like the way the whole video plays out. But it's one of those things where I'm like, the story works enough for me that I just don't care. Like, I'm not going to mm. sit there and be angry at it. Yeah. And I, I mean, like the first step towards, you know, making someone, you know, a better person is for them to want to try. So. All right. Let's move on to Dr. Stone. C equals 84. Dr. Stone. This is, is it, like the third. Is your, is your clock Dr. Stone. Broke, is your clock broken? No, Chris, because I think it is time. Because mine says it's time to get stoned. Yeah, so that I got that. Yeah. So, <laughs> chapter eighty four is Doctor Stone, which is like the third straight chapter or something like that that it says like this part of the story is called Doctor Stone. So I hope every cha- I hope this goes on for like fifty chapters, and every fucking chapter is called Doctor Stone, and everyone like we start reaching a point where someone starts like referring to chapters like you know my favorite chapter dr stone was dr stone and they're like which one well the part that was in dr stone the you know like the part dr stone and they're like (laughs) which one it was chapter three of dr stone within part three of dr stone of the dr stone manga (laughs) so sukasa has been frozen chris uh, in order to uh, hopefully eventually save his life was using the petrification uh, ray thing. In order to discover that, they need to get to the other side of the world, which is why Senku has gathered everyone in the Kingdom of Science, not just in the original village, but also all the people that were in Sukasa's empire, uh, and has gotten them all together in order to actually explain this plan to them, which is that, yes, that we need to uh, this we need to get to the other side of the world, which... All of the Stone Age people are very shocked to hear. And Magma's like, you would fall off the other side and die if you tried to do that. <laughs> um, which uh, gets him into a fight with Yo because Yo starts doing his laughing at Stone Age people thing. But then he's like, Ugh, I shouldn't laugh at you for being ignorant. Oh, no, go! Oh, I can't stop. Fall off the side of the earth. And then they just start punching each other because of this. Good old Yo. Yes. Um... Gen thinks to himself that it's going to be difficult to actually pull together these two two sides that were once enemies. And so he's like, ah, uh, as a mentalist, this is where I come in. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, Senku is talking with uh, some some people. Uh, uh, Yuzuriha plops a tricorner on his on his head and is just like, yeah, I made I made you a captain's hat because, you know, I, I, I figure it's the most appropriate thing that you're going to need for this. It's like, I'm part of the ha- ha- the arts and crafts club. Come on. So. Um, and yes, their 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 plan is to build a boat in order to sail to the other side of the world. And I do like that the way that this is illustrated, which is a bunch of people from the kingdom of science in like pirate gear, but they're on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> These two things do not match. Um, all of the people from the original uh, Ishigami village uh, get excited when they hear this because they live on the coast and they know all sorts of stuff about uh, creating boats. So Magma thinks that this is his chance to shine and and to show what he can offer uh, to people. Um, And uh, Seiko actually kind of like bows to the expertise of the Ishigami village people because he says, I'm a scientist. I don't know anything about actually sailing. So... Uh, Gen, however, proposes that everyone put forth design proposals. And uh, so, yeah, that's where, where they're going to go. And different groups split off in order to start working on this. And this is where we get to my favorite part of the chapter, because Magma goes off with some people uh, and uh, has Mantle g- send a call to the village so that they can send them uh, designs, basically, and explain stuff. Uh and Magma's like, yeah, Sukasa's out of the way. His army of goons is going to be looking for a leader, so I will make it clear to them who the leader should be. And they'll probably want to follow, in this case, the person who handles boats the best. So I'll take charge, and I'll show that I can be a good leader. Um, Yo hears this and is like, hey, guys, come help me design a cool boat! And goes off to do this as well. Uh, 
then we cut back to Magma's conversation and Mantle says like, well, hey, Sukasa has gone. Why don't you just kill Senku and, and do it sneakily and then take over that way? And he gets this really intense look on this face for a minute. And we get some flashbacks to the time that he went on the expedition together with Chrome and Senku. And he says, do you want to kill Senku? Because the guy makes some fun stuff. I'll give him that. And that's reason enough. So, no, he doesn't need to die. But that doesn't mean that I've given up on the chief's throne. I really like this moment. Uh, it, it, you know, Magma is still kind of an untrustworthy guy, but he has grown as a result of this. And he's a different character than he was at the start of uh, this whole thing. And if there's one thing that Niyagaki is really good at, it's bouncing a whole fuck ton of characters. And so he's doing this with this ever expanding cast. And I really like that. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely a value to keeping this sort of element that's on like I don't, it's just different from everybody else being Senku's friend. This is a guy who's kind of like, I still want to be chief, but I'm not going to kill Senku like I was before. So I still have these great ambitions, but, you know, I also have this newfound respect. It's a good amount of character growth that still keeps a somewhat like volatile element within the group. Hmm. So we get to the next day and Gen's like, all right, it's a design showdown. Everyone show off the boats that you've designed. And uh, it's Senku, Magma, and Yo who are doing this. So Magma and company get ready to unfurl their design. And Yo says, I'll give my presentation last because my awesome boat is already built and ready to go. What's the best way to sell an idea? It's simple. You show off the finished product, of course. You prove it has probably worked so hard on that. Ah, I shouldn't laugh at the ignorant. And they unfurl this design, and it's basically like one of those Pacific Islander uh, kind of rafts, the really big rafts uh, that with the large sails, and they're big enough to have like a shack sitting on the deck. Uh, and everyone's like, oh, for, yeah, that looks great. If Magnus is that good, I can't wait to see Yo's, right? He says that he already finished his. And then they, like, they cut over to Yo, and he's like, oh, no, 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 I didn't. No, no, I forgot my boat at home. I, and then just, <laughs> I actually want to call attention to something, too. Yo is so stunned by how much better their <laughs> boat is. His eye breaks through the stone cover that he's had on his face and it's gone. Like that piece of character design was shattered by his own like, oh, God, my boat design sucks. I completely missed that. <laughs> so, yeah, he's, it's not on future pictures. He shows up. In. <laughs> it just breaks off as he's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I love that he's like, uh, the dog ate my homework. <laughs> There's just this shitty boat out there. He's like, I don't know what boat that is. Like setting fire to it. Like, oh. Like the freaking dog whoops off the the mat that had covered it up. And it's, it's five logs barely strung together in like a mass that has like a piece of tarp hanging loosely from it. You still put a flag that says yo on it. Yeah, it says yo on it. <laughs> Uh, so Senku, uh, inspects the design of this, uh, ship and he's like, oh, are the sails made of woven straw? And Magma's like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> Just gives it away immediately. He's like, what? <laughs> uh, but Senku's like, oh yeah, that, this is great. You know, you guys experience is, is going to be great. And at the very least, those sails are going to help us, but here's the ship we're going to start building. And he has basically designed a Spanish galleon. Mm -hmm. uh, and everyone in the village is just like, yeah, we're making that one. We're going to make that one. Like, even uh, I think some of the people who were allied with Mag were like, yeah, we're going to build that instead. Uh, and Mag was just like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Chrome says, I mean, with how amazing this thing looks, though, I mean, like, it had taken us centuries to build. And because it's like, oh, I'll never live to see this. Like, the guy from the from the ex, from the the space expedition inhabits his body. He's like, oh, we might as well just give up now. I'll burn it so we don't have to look at it anymore. <laughs> uh, but then they, Kaseki and Chrome realize, oh, right, we have hundreds of people to work with now. It's not just the two of us who have to build this. And they start getting to work. Some time passes and we see that uh, everyone's basically working on the skeleton of the vessel. Um, 
And as everyone's contributing to, to this, uh, Ukio mentions to Gen, who is, of course, struggling under the weight of his load. Uh, hey, what was the point of that design showdown? I mean, we all knew that Senku's design was going to win. So why bother setting up to begin with? And Gen says, well, in magic, there is something that you do called forcing. You say, here, pick a card, any card. And the unwitting participant is forced to make a, a specific choice, but they believe the choice was actually theirs. You convince them of that because even a strong leader can't bring people together by force. So he kind of tricked them into thinking that they needed to choose Senku. But uh, it was it's a it's a cool way to add his con contribution to this whole thing. Yeah. So. Uh, and then in order to uh, wrap things up. Uh, after we get the point of like, yes, everyone knows that Seku knows that people represent power. We cut to uh, Nikki and the reporter girl. I don't even know if she's even given, been given a name yet. Uh, and she's very upset because Tsukasa has is gone. Uh, and and uh, so she's just like curled into a fetal position on the ground while everyone else is working. And Seku approaches her and says, uh, Sukasa said that, you know, he revived you specifically because you can gather intelligence really effectively. So I have a job for you. And immediately she stands up and is like, I have breasts. What do you need me to do? <laughs> I really expected because there's like a swing sound effect, which doesn't gel in my mind as like a boob jiggle sound effect. But in my mind, it's a boom, like <laughs> immediately because that's the like her breath. Nothing else of her in the frame crosses over the panel except her breath like it's not as though her breasts were just so far out they did like her hair doesn't it stays behind the frame her leg doesn't cross over but her breasts do yes they wanted everyone to know Sukas um, is assigning her specifically the task of getting a captain we need more allies because people equals power so yeah I wasn't sure if he was saying that she should be the captain I don't know if that's necessarily it. Uh, she asks him, what do you need? And he says a captain. So maybe they're actually going to tr maybe they'll try and revive uh, someone who would be a good nautical captain. Or maybe she'll pick someone out from the people already available to them. Or, yeah, maybe hell, she'll be she'll be the captain for some reason. But we'll see. Nick, you know who would make a really great captain? Me. No, go ahead. Oh. Well, you would. I think you'd be fantastic. But also Seahawk. I think he should be the captain. <laughs> I'm just imagining how well he would fit into this series, honestly. <laughs> so all these fucking weirdos running around helping everything, and then there's just this guy with a shiny mustache going, Adventure! <laughs> and lighting boats on fire. They're like, no, we need this one. Oh no, he would he would be like the the exact opposite, but somehow still the same result of the of the uh doom and gloom guy. <laughs> We're on our way now! I'll set our boat on fire so we'll succeed! <laughs> He's like, I like this idea. <laughs> It'll never work if we set the boat on fire. Let's just set it on fire. Let's set ourselves on fire, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fun chapter of uh, Dr. Stone and uh, some good character moments as well. Yes. And if you all are curious about why we brought up Seahawk, you can find out more about our opinions of Seahawk and She-Ra in our November bonus podcast, which is a review of She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. And we had a lot of fun talking about it. Yep. So. Uh, all right. Next, we are talking about, uh, is it Seven Deadly Sins? Yeah, That's next. Let's talk about That's Seven fun. Deadly Sins, Chapter 291. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So last time, the fight was sort of beginning between Chandler and Cusack against what seemed like it was maybe going to be a two-on-two -two thing, but it, it really kind of feels like it's just against Merlin. And these are, you know, two of the strongest figures known to the, you know this universe at this point. And we had this moment where Ludashell's like, they're invincible. And Merlin said, well, if they're invincible, then we'll just give them a weakness. Uh, and I was very curious what that meant. It turns out uh, there's a lot of very video gamey logic to work off of this <laughs> chapter. Because Merlin's like, because uh, they're both getting hit by random attacks. And they're like, we don't understand this. And Merlin explains that she let out very small amounts of different elemental attacks. And they've been kind of using that to analyze which attribute they were least resilient against. So Chandler is least resilient to lightning. And Kusek 
is least resilient to wind. It's not their weakness. They're just least resilient to it. So she then created more spells that are infinitely expanding off of that, that are slowly peppering at and weakening their resistances to those specific elements individually. And when Chandler realizes this, he's like, ah, all I need to do now is know the cause. I use absolute can't. And before he can do it, he's struck by lightning. And she's like, I know what I'll do. I'll just cancel everything. <laughs> <laughs> and Merlin explains that the air is alive with countless lightning and wind magics that can't be sensed and are automatically attacking you in response to every chant and move. And they will continue to spawn forth from my infinity magic. And what Merlin has essentially dead. done is she is that one guy you would do imaginary fights with who would just find the absolute umpteenth way to one up you and is just doing that. It's were- like, no, see, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, but I'm immune to fire damage. Oh, but this isn't fire. This is black fire, which spawns from a different element and it's increasing. So it actually weakens you as it hits you. Uh, all right, well, then I'll roll and put out the fire. No, when you roll, it increases the fire. And now it's even harder. It's it black fire. fire. It works the opposite way that fire does. <laughs> yeah. All right, then I try to put ga- like oxygen on it. I think that's what would make a fire grow. No, because it has all the original properties of fire as well. So now it's just growing even faster. Like, See, it has all the strengths and none of the weaknesses of real fire, and it's better. <laughs> it's like, we're never playing with Kawaki again. Never again are we playing with this fucking obnoxious shit. But guys, I'm level 25! <laughs> but we're playing at level 30. Did I say 25? I meant 2,000. Uh, I made 2,000 two versions of my character sheet, just so I'd always have a stronger one. <laughs> so, Ludashell echoes this by being like, What's this crazy over the top magic? And Rowan's like, even I don't know. Oh, I just started combining shit together. And she's like, I just combined two types of attri- uh, attribute attack magic with invisibility, with imperception, with auto tracking, and infinity. And I don't know. It seems really effective. <laughs> and it's like, huh? So there's a very small moment I'll note here where Hendrickson's like, Ludashell, Gil Thunder is dying use your your magic to heal him and Ludashell's like he didn't do it to protect me and besides I have to conserve as as much magic as I can right now it's like oh interesting dick uh Cusack's like how dare this puny human insult high ranking demons like us and he starts laughing she's like what's so funny he's like resonant and it seems to like form some kind of hypnosis and they say ah that's the dozing god of death's power he'll instantly take control of the mind of his target and rob them of all power over themselves just like dozing off does and like yes thank you very on the nose with that explanation (laughs) and we see that the you know the true form of of uh merlin as we know is kind of like this little girl so cusack's kind of taunting her he's like oh aren't you cute and oh now, look at the widow sorcerer yeah and now you are now you have to take the same fate as uh, as arthur uh and he's like your very soul is my prisoner now and she's like right back at you huh <laughs> and she punches him oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and he goes fine and she like as a little kid kind of crawls on top of him and she's like I already knew you'd try to possess me. I honestly thought you could take over, uh, take me over after I've been granted to bless the supreme deity and possess mental training. Like, you really think you could just mind control me? You're the one who stepped into hell, and now to avenge Arthur to my heart's content. And I like Chandler doesn't know this is happening, so he's like, "What's taking so long? Hurry up and use your resume, you asshole!" <laughs> and then he starts getting electrocuted because he's talking. He's like, "Ow! Ow! Ow! Ow!" <laughs> And all this stuff's happening as these explosions are kind of going off. And Zeldris gets up and he's like, don't get ahead of yourself with the Demon Lord's magic. Your magic is nothing to fear. And he tries to strike. And L- Ludashell just does it again, where she just instantly pops it and just fucking one stroke slashes and like knocks him. Oh, stop it. And as we found out, that was also simultaneously when Chandler and Cusack were taken down. So they won. <laughs> The heroes were victorious. I a little surprised that it felt this quote unquote easy to beat both Chandler and Cusack, but I guess that's Merlin for you. Like it'd be more obnoxious if she was constantly broken and winning every fight. But 
I guess in this one situation where they kind of forced it upon her, then it makes sense. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, but as this is happening, we have to remember what's been happening elsewhere. And this is right. where that magic. This is and this is why we had the flashback uh, to this point. All of this was taking place before uh, the moment we left off on the previous fight. Mm-hmm. So. Instantly, the memory that was kind of hidden away by the original Gauther all those times ago is finally broken and freed, yeah. and Ludashell remembers everything at once. She she starts kind of thinking, all I can remember is Esterosa's face, the man who killed Male. And we get a narrator saying, at that moment, far up above them, Gauther's spell broke. The altered consciousnesses of everybody who had known Esterosa of the Ten Commandments and Male of the Four Archangels crumbled and fell apart. And the shock of that would turn the tides of the war in Camelot. Bum, bum, bum. Mm-hmm. That was all right. I, I, it's it's a weird conclusion. You had to sit there and you're like, oh, right, I guess Merlin is stupidly broken. <laughs> right. But she just never does anything, which I guess fits with her being the, the sin of sloth, I believe. Mm. So it's... Oh, uh, she's the sin of gluttony. Is she, no, I thought... Isn't pride that... is pride is pride. Um, Eskinar's pride. Right. Um, is it Meliodas, no, wait, no. Meliodas King, is wrath. King Sloth, isn't he? King is greed, isn't he? Because he no, swipes it. Oh, sorry. Bond. Wait, no, wait, I, I got wait, the two of them Hold on. <laughs> I think that that's that's envy, I believe, is uh, Diane. I don't know how to get to Seven Deadly Sins without getting shit that's unrelated to the manga. <laughs> um, hold on, no. I, if people are screaming at us right now about this. I don't um, care. We are going to find it independently of you guys. Di- Diane is Envy. Bon right. is Greed. King is Sloth. Gauther Ga- is Gauther Lust. Gauther is Lust. Merlin is Gluttony. Okay. Well, then I don't know why she doesn't do anything for fucking hundreds of chapters at a time. <laughs> Well, they did establish when she first when they first introduced power levels, she was said to be like pretty easily the strongest and like all of it was in one stat. So, yeah, she seems like she's somebody who's not always broken. But if she gets the time to prepare stuff, because I didn't explain it, but they mentioned like she had all that time to set this up essentially as she was fucking teleporting away from that vacuum power over and over. Right. So while all of that was going on, she was not doing anything because she was busy doing other stuff. So. All right. So let's move on to the promised Neverland. Uh, And now for something completely different. (laughs) This was a bit of a shock. It's chapter 113, the King of Paradise. So if I'm not mistaken, pretty sure this is an indication of what the hell Norman's been up to. I'm I'm not sure. I'm not 100 percent, but I I, feel like it is. I feel like it is. And he's maybe impersonating uh, Minerva or he's taking up the mantle of Minerva or or something. I I don't know. This is a very confusing chapter. (laughs) This chapter focuses on this squadron of bizarre demon hunter guys who, of course, all have very eccentric appearances and their own unique weapons and stuff. There's like one guy who looks like he's dressed appropriately for going uh, demon facility hunting because he's got like, you know, an army oh, uniform. Dude, yeah. Yeah. Then there's one who's got like, I am a serial killer uh, mask on. Yeah, there's a like guy fucking Faust from Guilty Gear. One guy looks like he's going to tend bar. And then there is like Jinx from League of Legends there. Like, so they go, they've gone in slaughtering demons. One of them makes a crack about, can I eat them later? And they're like, whatever. They, there's a bunch of dialogue that gets exchanged between them to give you a bit of an idea of what their personalities are. And then they come across uh, Nick, the main Which one do you think you are? Which one do I think I am? Yeah, which one are you? Of this group of characters whose names we don't know. Uh, Based off the character they shoot us. Let's see. To that. Uh, probably Army Guy, just because he doesn't seem like he gives a shit about anything. He's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm Baghead, because his only line was, oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I relate to that. So, they get into the heart of this facility. It's a mass production uh, farm, so there's a bunch of humans that are there that are just strung up to feeding equipment, chained down, and uh, they're like, oh, wow, okay. Uh, 
the guy who looks like he's probably Norman says like, oh, how's the security? And it's like, ah, oh, we took it all out. Um, the, um, they cut up some of the bonds and start to free the, uh, cattle. And, uh, the leader says like, come on, we've come to save you. But the guy is basically comatose. And so he gives him a, a hug and says, if we remove these devices from them, they're, they're going to die. So there's nothing we can do for them at this point. We'll free them from their shackles. That's all that we can really do, but that's it. And then, uh, he says, the next time you come into this world, I hope you can live your lives to the fullest as humans. They cut the power to the facility and then they burn it to the ground. Uh, so they destroy the facility and uh, the guy, the leader who looks like he might be Norman says, I'll decimate all farms, release all children and end this Neverland. And then and they head back home, apparently traveling very quickly. Mm-hmm. And he gets to this balcony where a whole bunch of children are looking up at him. And I'm not sure if this is like actually happening or if he's imagining this. But uh, he says, I will create a paradise for you all. Everyone's cheering Minerva, Minerva up at him. I do hope that this is Norman at the very least, because it would be interesting to see him take a different approach to Emma and Ray now that he uh, is out there on his own and free. Uh, I'm sure that we'll find out before too long. Also, it seems as though this would indicate that he is the one who actually contacted Emma's group uh, with that last uh, message before they had to abandon their hideout. That would make sense, too. Um, The message, by the way, is I shall give you the world you deserve. First, leave the farms and go to this place. They translate the numbers from the code book and uh, say once you have all the words, it says go to the jaw of the lion. Uh. Some guy who looks like he's a Digimon protagonist says that was in the map in the shelter. I saw it when we were searching for the temple in the golden water. And uh, I forget what her name is. We have heard from her before, I think, but I can't remember it. OK. Uh, Sh- so Schmeggles. Schmeggles knows where the uh, location is, and it's in the middle of wasteland about a 10 days walk to the west. So that's where they're being told to go. So that's where they head out to. They set up this uh, this little memorial for uh, Hugo and Lucas and all the people who died at this facility. Uh, and Emma says, you know, watch us. We'll change the world. Let's go. And that's the chapter. I'm not sure how I feel about this chapter. Mm. Uh, I think the thing that really is weird to me is this new group. And mm-hmm. the fact that they all have these very shonen-y out there designs, mm-hmm. which does not match this series whatsoever. Like, no one has had a design that has not felt exactly like where they were before. Even when they started meeting new people, like, even Yugo's design felt like it fit exactly in that kind of... Yeah, he just like, had weird hair and facial hair. So. But, like, it's like, oh, well, then there's this group. We have fucking, like, Harley Quinn and Butler Guy and bass uh, fucking bag mass swordsman crazy guy and i'm like this is very strange i'm not really comfortable with uh the promised neverland getting like battle shown in on me like this right it's one of those things where it just feels like more and more the series is getting away from what made it unique to begin with mm-hmm. so um I, I'm right there with you in terms of the group itself. If this, I am curious about this kind of third faction being at work uh, in the story and how that could cause complications for what uh, Emma is trying to accomplish. So, yeah. All right. Next up. Uh, all right. Let's talk about Black Clover then. Page 183 The Raging Bull joins the showdown. And that's where we were kind of picking up. So Henry and the rest of the Black Bulls arrived inside of the Black Bulls hideout. And there's a moment where uh, Yami's like, ah, what an entrance. Great to see you idiots. And uh, the rest of the members of the Black Bull who are there kind of all have their moments of being like, wow, it's crazy that you're here. Like, I like Zoro who's just like, what is that thing? What? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Is that a building? <laughs> and uh, a whole bunch of elves try to attack the uh, Black Bull base. And uh, like there's this big description. I don't know if anyone's supposed to be saying it, but it feels as though someone's reiterating this test because they're like, Lux, high mana detection. It gauges the magic attack's affinity and intercepts it. 
it kind of seems like someone should be like like someone like Yami should be observing this and saying like, oh, when they all work together, they become this unstoppable force yeah. at the end of it. But it, we just kind of get the setup for that. Like this is uh, the things that are working and that's it. Yeah, and it's like, so it, it doesn't really it doesn't really conclude with uh, with anything. It's just like, yay. Here's what all these people do. Maybe it's a way to remind people, I guess, because a lot of these are characters who are teleported away at the end of it to be like, here's a quick Possibly. reminder of what they do. Because they explained Vanessa uses her fate manipulation. Charming gets everyone healthy again with her magic. Uh, and Henry can smash people with the Black Bull headquarters. So Patrick's angry. He's like, God damn it. Get out of here. And uh, he's, you know, someone interrupts him. He's like, I'll go. And they're like, oh, you're finally awake, huh? Well, this will be your first time in several centuries casting a spell. Are you going to be okay? And the person's like, no problem. And we see that it's Dorothy Unsworth, the captain of the Coral Peacocks. And I'm I'm glad that the elf that reincarnated her also had the same kind of sleeping gimmick as the original person did. It's very, very convenient that it worked <laughs> out that way. <laughs> and there's this mist that's happening. This apparently very beautiful magic. And then suddenly a huge chunk of the Black Bull base is just gone. Uh, Henry is not one of the people taken, nor is Asta, but Henry can sense all the magic pieces, but they don't exist anywhere. So what the heck's happening? Right. It's not even spatial magic. Yeah, it's very confusing. And Kirsch explains that it's over when she activates her magic. The targets are carried off to the world of dreams and there's not a thing they can do about it. And then uh, the elf taking over Gauche and Patry use a combo attack where Gauche sets up a bunch of mirrors and then Patry sends his light beams into it and they just barrage the living crap out of the Black Bull's base. And kind of actually a pretty cool image of just fucking shitting all over the Black Bull base. <laughs> it's like, I don't know a better way to phrase it. So the only people who didn't get taken were uh, Asta, Henry, Rades, and the other person basically i forget his name but the one who could teleport yeah it's uh, the people got sucked into uh dorothy's spell are uh magna luck sally vanessa and uh charmy yeah uh, and gauche or elf gauche rather says leave the rest of us you go on ahead with your precious leashed and i like how he's like D don't say it like that <laughs> makes it sound weird i'm not gay <laughs> Uh, and then we cut over to the dream world where all those characters just mentioned are trapped mm -hmm. and Dorothy or elf Dorothy, whatever you'd call her says, welcome to the world where all is as I wish it to be. It's that one level in the Simpsons arcade game. You have to fight a bowling ball with arms at the end of this. Oh, that's such a sweet game. I love it. It's a very fun game. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, that's the chapter. That, that's a, that, that happened. Yep, that happened. We'll see where it goes. Uh, let's move on to One Piece, chapter 925. Ooh, 25. Uh, absence. So this is picking up where the things left off at the end of the first act of the Wano arc. Uh we see some stuff happening around the world to begin with. First of all, uh, Moria has reemerged. Uh, we see Perona reading the newspaper in uh, the Grand Line, where Mi the area where Mihawk lives, and uh, she like goes like, "Oh my God, your know, Lord Moria is alive!" And the the headline is Gecko Moria and his zombie army attack. Uh, and Mihawk's like, yeah, I read about that this morning. And P Perona's like, well, "Why didn't you tell me?" And he's like, "I don't give a shit about it." <laughs> Um, so they bicker for a little bit, uh, basically, um, like Perona saying like, don't you, you know, come on, don't you owe me anything for all the stuff that I've done for you? It's like, I, I've, I, I have cooked more meals than you have. And it's like, I, well, I help you uh, with your fields. Like, well, yeah, but I let you live here. I do like, like fucking landlord Mihawk who's just like, <laughs> do you have any idea how much I've cooked for you? He's like, I've cooked more than you and I helped out with your fields. I'm paying for your Reuben board. <laughs> And like then she's like, fine, I'm out of here. And he's like, be safe. Oh, now you're going to be nice. He's like, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> I saw Tech King posting about them. And he's like, they have totally been doing it while <laughs> she's been living here. And he's like, they are really bickering like a couple, honestly. <laughs> but uh, 
I, I, I'm actually surprised that she did actually spend her in the entire like two years just living with Mihawk, apparently doing nothing. <laughs> um, but Mihawk actually mentions like, you know, it's actually probably a good idea for you to leave because an odd subject has arisen at the reverie. We don't find out about what, what about that. Instead, we cut over to where Moria is, uh, where he has basically invaded Blackbeard's territory and is demanding that Teach come out and face him. I want to note the island is called Fulaled, which is a pretty metal title. <laughs> it's a great uh, pirate uh, island title. Yeah. Uh, there are some people who are observing what's going on and uh, are just going like, ah, ah, all right, what's going on here? Uh, including... The fourth ship captain of the Blackbeard Pirates, the corrupt king, Avalo Pizarro. And uh, they're like, and so people are like, Captain Pizarro, that's a former warrior of the sea. It's like, well, why'd you let him in? <laughs> he, he destroyed the port. <laughs> uh, and uh, they say he's looking for Commodore Teach and that invisible man, Absalom, who showed up the other day. And the guys are like, oh, okay. <laughs> this doesn't give shit. Uh, Seemingly, Absalom calls out to Moria and says, Lord Moria, I'm up here. And Moria, of course, is very happy to see him. He's like, I'm not going anywhere, though. This place is heaven. I just forgot to give you a call to give you to let you know what that I decided to stay here. Uh, and Moria's just like, oh, well, OK. Um, but he also says, like, you know, there's a lot of folks out there who want your uh, what I see here. I can't I can't tell exactly who's fucking saying this stuff. I think it's Moria talking because Mor he says Moria's talking because he's mentioning yeah. he's like, oh, well, you know, I feel bad about hitting all these people because I thought I was rescuing you. And, you know, it's pretty important because Blackbeard pirates are famous for hunting down people with powers. And he's like, I bet a lot of people will be looking out for you. So I just assumed right. they took you when I was fucking people up. And no, apparently you were safe. Mm. At that moment, while he is distracted, uh, he gets cut in the side and Moria, of course, is shocked by this uh, for a minute. And emerging from nowhere is Shiryu of the Rain, the second ship captain of the Blackbeard Pirates, the invisible man with the clear, clear fruit. <gasps> and Moria says, you can turn invisible, but that's Absalom's power. And Absalom starts cackling with the laugh pattern of Murun hoo 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 which is a totally natural way to laugh. Yep. Uh, they then transform into Katarina Divan, the sixth ship captain of the Blackbeard Pirates, Pirates, the Crescent Moon Hunter, who has the dog dog fruit, mythical mythical type model nine tailed fox. So she is has Kitsune powers, including illusions, seemingly. Uh, Moria, of course, is really pissed off about this, uh, and. Uh, uh, she says it was his fault for wandering into our lair. If you want his body, we still got it. I know you love a good corpse. So according to her, apparently Absalom is just dead off screen. So I there mean, you go. We haven't seen the process of which Blackbeard takes other people's fruit outside of Whitebeard. And Who was dead. Yeah. So, so I, it's, it's not unthinkable to think that he's taking the fruit by killing them in some way. So right. if that's the case, yeah, it's kind of a dark thing where Absalom's just fucking murdered off screen. Mm. Uh, so Moria has seemingly wandered into a really bad situation by doing this. And uh, also um, for, teaches there and he cackles over uh, seemingly a PA system or he might even be using his earthquake powers in order to amplify his voice. That'd be a cool way of doing it. Mm. Um. But uh, he is shouting at him from his stronghold, basically saying, "Like, hey, don't go disturbing the peace here on Pirate Island. I might be leisure now, and this is a pirate's paradise. It ought to be fun. Do you like pi partying, Moria? Then come ride on my ship instead. Didn't you read the morning paper? There's never a dull moment. On just the fourth day of the reverie, the captains of the Revolutionary Army bust into Sacred Mary Joa to rescue Kuma, and they clash with Navy admirals Ryokugyu and Fujitor in the process. Meanwhile, events are transpiring in Wano, where the dreaded monster Kaido dwells. All the young folks with angry blood like Straw Hat have gathered there, while the Mad Empress Big Mom lays chase. What do you suppose happens now? It's already begun. The mighty battle for supremacy over the throne. No quarter given. 
it's crazy how much this explains and like teases without even like I'm almost like, God, I wish we could follow this. And I'm like thinking here, I'm like, he's actually talking about two very separate plot threads, which all are like one's currently like what we're following. One we got a taste of it is clearly progressed without us. But I'm still like, oh, isn't this cool third plot line also great with Blackbeard just explains stuff to us? And he's surrounded by all these people who are partying with him. Uh, and we also get a look at what his current bounty is. So remember how Luffy had the, you know, like billion and a half bounty, Chris? Yep. Yeah, that was nice while it lasted. <laughs> Very impressive. Oh, wait, two, two billion to two hundred and forty seven million six hundred thousand. It's very impressive. Yeah. Makes very sense, though. He's been causing a lot of shit. So, yeah. Uh, also, I like how he's just like this is apparently just Blackbeard's um, hanging out clothing. <laughs> His Three fucking, pistols shoved into his belt. His pajama pants, it looks <laughs> like. So that's all going on. Anyway, <laughs> let's go back to Wano now. Uh, when we get back, uh, it's uh, in the middle of a sword battle between Ashura and Dogstorm. Uh, they are clashing blades while a bunch of people look on, uh, including Kinemon and uh, Okiku. Uh, so we don't really know exactly what's going on between going on between them. They've run into each other, but that's really all we see for now. Uh, we seemingly get a flashback from there uh, to where um, Otama was brought home to her Tengu buddy. And uh, she seems to be doing quite well. Like choppers fixed her up and her wounds were apparently quite shallow. Uh, she says that she doesn't really remember what happened. She just, it was she basically passed out from fright after Horselina tried to defend her. Uh, and uh, she is, of course, worried about Luffy. And Chopper's just like, oh, don't worry about Luffy. He'll be fine. <laughs> Luffy's going to be OK. Yeah. Uh Fucking everyone basically went to confront Ashura from that group that was with Dogstorm. And uh, he says that, like, hey, I, I'm the one here who should be upset at you guys. Just be glad I'm not robbing all of you, because do you remember how this started? I was a samurai who put his life on the line, devoted to one man, Kozuki Odin. And now I don't and I did not swear fealty to the Kozuki clan. Uh, so there you go. He. Did that's why he's not uh, just immediately agreeing to join up with them, and apparently why they got pissed at each other and started fighting, uh, which uh, Carrot is very shocked by because he actually went to a draw with Dogstorm, but we don't really know anything about how powerful Dogstorm and Cat Viper are. So we know they were significantly powerful, but mm -hmm. it's one of those things where it's just basically saying like these are all because remember they mentioned like we need to gather together the nine. Samurai, I guess it was the three remaining mm -hmm. ones, so they'd have all of them, and then that would be a force worth hundreds. So the idea we're supposed to get is that they are all super powerful, right. even after twenty years. Mm. And Kinemon says that Ashura had better not forget what kind of man I was, because I will gain your loyalty. Ashura just says, "Well, yeah, good luck trying like that, but don't assume that everyone's just going to jump at the return of the of the Kazoki Samurai. Y'all abandoned the country for twenty long years, and that absence won't ever vanish." Uh, but we cut away from there before really hearing too much. Uh, we cut over to Ogre Island, the heart of uh, Kaido's stronghold in this area. And, uh, they're talking about, you know, kind of financial woes that they're having right now. Cause you know, Doflamingo's not there. Uh, one of them says, uh, one of the guys who was talking says like, Hey Jack, you know, without Doflamingo around who our next business partner is, don't you? So we don't need any more dead weight around here. We've already got Queen. And Queen says, yeah, we don't need more scum when we've already got King. Two very important characters introduced from Kaido's group. Mm -hmm. uh, King the Wildfire and Queen the Plague. And uh, and they're referring to Jack as Jack the Stooge. So seemingly, oh, card suits. Gotcha. Well, I or think it's, I, it's, it's also the specifically the natural disasters. I forget what Jack was. Jack was like the 
fucking tsunami or hurricane or something like that. They're finishing off that trio. And presumably these are going to be two of the main players when we finally get to the fights because these are Kaido's like elite dudes. And seemingly they're more powerful than Jack from the way that they're treating oh, him. Oh, certainly. So, yeah. yeah. I'm sure it's car it's card suits in there as well, but also okay. the, the titles are a significant thing. Yeah, the drought. Hmm. And uh, that's it. That's uh, the the chapter. Uh, we cut it right around to learn a lot of stuff, and now we're done. So, <laughs> but it was good stuff. Uh, it was really nice to see Blackbeard again after so fucking long. So. Yeah, I do love Blackbeard. He is such a great character in that series. And uh, now we're going to wrap things up with our final weekly chapter of World Trigger, starting oh, next yeah. month. Starting next month, this is going to be a monthly series. So we're only going to get it about every four weeks. So here we go. All right. Chapter 169, Tamakoma 2, part 22. <laughs> I fucking love World Trigger. <laughs> so we start off this chapter with a flashback to uh, where Suzunari was basically creating this strategy involving Taichi reaching the, uh, the power box and turning off the lights inside of the mall. And... Uh, as they're, they, they were basically trying to figure out, we've got to do something here because, like, yeah, we've got this new strategy, the, this new formation, but it's going to only get us so far in this match. We need some sort of really powerful strategy that's a really insane edge. Uh, and we should do that by, you know, of course, taking advantage of the of the map that we, we get to pick it. And I like that Tai Chi's first idea is, well, we could try poisoning the other squad's operators. <laughs> It would work. <laughs> I mean, that is fair. Um, I, I, I like that uh, their operator just says, like, I mean, I guess that would be effective, but that's just kind of messed up. <laughs> like, that is a valid strategy. You'd have to abandon all sense of fair play to do it, but. <laughs> and also morals and be willing to go to jail. <laughs> um, So. Tai Chi, of course, is the one who actually proposed this idea. He says he pulled it out of his stupid looking hat. Uh, <laughs> no, he's been. He... <laughs> I know it's one of those things I've been like almost afraid to ask. I'm like, I'm trying to remember why you hate Tai Chi. And I think it is solely because you hate his hat and he's like the worst character because of it. <laughs> uh, he says he's actually been sitting on this idea for a while. Uh we cut back to the present and we basically see the blackout oh, happen. I, I want to run with this bit a little bit more. So like you're driving to work and you're like, oh, OK, you're like, fuck, I need gas. It's all because of Tai Chi and his stupid hat. <laughs> I can't ban it. I just blame things outside of manga on him. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're looking over. You're like, oh, I wonder what's going on on Twitter. Great. Netflix canceled Daredevil. It's all because of Tai Chi and his stupid act. Did that happen? Yeah, it did. <laughs> really? It just happened, yeah. Wow. Well, okay then. Guess that whole thing is done then. All yeah, right. I'm, I'm sure it is. Fucking Tai Chi and his stupid <laughs> act. God damn it, Tai Chi. Your stupid hat cost us Daredevil. I thought you were just being Chris. I just thought that you were being, you know, like just coming up with scenarios. I had no idea that this was like real world consequences that were actually yeah, happening. No, you're going to be you're going to be driving to work later today and be like, I need gas. God damn it. <laughs> uh, WWE decided to go ahead with their Saudi Arabia show, despite all of the moral quandaries involved in doing so. I'm fucking touching his stupid hat. Nick, I'm sorry. Becky Lynch has uh, suffered a concussion and won't be able to participate at Survivor Series. Oh, uh, it's all because Nia Jax re reads World Trigger and likes Tai Chi's stupid hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's going to get a push from it. Of course she would, because Tai Chi's hat is so fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, um, we get to back to the present and we basically see the blackout happen from the perspective of the skirmish happening between Kagiura squad and Suzunari squad. Uh, and uh, we see a little bit of stuff happening before the blackout occurs. For example, Kagiura uses his winding snake uh, blade thing to try and attack uh, from the blind spots offered to him by all the furniture in the narrow space. Uh and uh, the things actually look as though uh, they're growing really well for Kageyura's squad uh, at, at this point. 
But then, of course, they switch off the lights uh, and they importantly, uh, Susan R. Squad syncs up, turn off the lights with changing the visual support on. And the lights go out in the brief and in the brief instant where that happens, Ko uh, swipes his black sword through the air. And basically, it's only because of Kagura's side effect that he's able to sense the danger coming and he ducks and just barely escapes being eliminated uh, as a result of that. So everyone realizes at this moment, like it seems as though the reason why uh, he's using the black Kogetsu is because then it can't be seen in the dark and they can use it this way. Uh so everyone is, of course, reacting to, you know, the lights being turned out. And because they were able to change the night vision on in that brief instant, they were able to get that. So even though Kagura Squad changes on the uh, night vision support, uh, as soon as they do, basically, you know, Kagura's like, all right, yeah, now we're fine on even ground. And then Taichi just switches the lights back on and they turn visual support off. And it's like, you know, looking at daylight through night vision goggles. So Kagura is instead briefly blinded from that. And uh, he ends up suffering a wound to his shoulder and almost gets eliminated because it just barely misses his uh, his try on core. So, uh, of course, the operators for uh, Hikari for Kagura squad is struggling to keep up with this because, you know, they're just switching the lights on and off. And she's got to react to it as opposed to uh, Susanari squad who is communicating this. And they're just basically sticking it up perfectly and not, and not actually suffering any uh, latency, basically, in it. So very, very, very dirty strategy. I like it. Uh, All right, Taichi, you get this one, I suppose. <laughs> uh, Zoe uh, communicates with user and is just like, hey, can you shoot Taichi? And he's like, he's not on the radar. Well, we should know where we know where the fuse box is, right? Give me the coordinates. And Hikari eventually, while she's struggling with uh, the night vision turning on and off, she's like, OK, yeah, it's here. So user is just like, blam, shoots a sniper rifle at the fuse box. And Taichi has set up a fucking barrier in front of himself. An escudo, uh, something that I don't I, I could not even remember uh, because it's been so long since we've had a World Trigger fight. But yeah, it's, it's not basically a police it, barrier. Yeah, it hasn't been used too much in like regular battles. I think it's f one of its first appearances actually when Karasuma used it during the evasion arc, but it's been slowly appearing more and more frequently uh, to the point where like, you're like, Oh, okay. Like this is like not that uncommon of a thing. I guess it's just mm -hmm. because it's not nearly as flexible as regular try on shields. Right. And they've set up this, he just set up this tower shield in front of himself. So he can't just be sniped from a long distance. So users like, I, I can't just shoot him from here. I've actually got to go and approach him. So, Zoe uh, changes strategies and just shoots out all of the lights in the restaurant that they're in, uh, just sends it in, into darkness so that they can't just turn the lights on and off. And I like how one of the commentators says he's sensible in a simple sort of way. They're like, I mean, that solves the problem like a dumb person would do. <laughs> Uh, so everyone's cast into darkness. Uh, Ko still wants to, to Murakami still wants to take out Kagiro while they're inside of the restaurant, uh, which, you know, they're still stuck in, in the restaurant at this point. So what are they going to do? Mm -hmm. Um, and of course they're still pushed to the limit. Uh, one of the commentators says, yeah, Zoe could, you know, use the meteor to just blow open a hole in the wall and they could just escape the mall completely. But they have no idea where all the snipers are hanging out. So if they were to do that, they would just draw attention to themselves and they get shot the fuck up. So because of that, they can't act recklessly. Um, so we cut then from there over to Osamu, who managed to get away to safety, it seems. Uh, he, of course, has lost one arm and he's leaking Tryon. Uh but he seems to be hiding in a corner uh, safe for the time being. Um, he oh, uh, oh, there's a mistake here, Chris. Oh, no. Oh. Uh, he says that the, that that trick with the lights may have cost me my left arm. Oh, it's his right arm. Oh, <gasps> hold on. Let me send a message for on. shame. Let me send a message to Lee's. Hey, you dumb basket <laughs> of shit. <laughs> Way to ruin world trigger. Sincerely. I literally yours. did not. 
realize that until just this moment. So. All right, everybody, we're going to have to make a big deal out of this. Everybody yeah. send on Elise messages and say, you suck, you suck, World Trigger sucks. I can't believe you fucked this up. No, send her a message as you rock. But you made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, but what is, this is unforgivable. Right. And you will never be allowed on Weekly Manga Recap <laughs> again. Please show up to discuss World Trigger with us soon. Uh, so, um, however, that moment, uh, Susanari Squad's operator, not Susanari Squad, sorry. It is Susanari Squad. Yes, sorry. I got all my squads mixed up for a minute. Uh, Warren's Taichi, someone's making a beeline for you. They vanished from the radar, so you need to get out of there immediately. And so he does the same thing that he did before when he was crawling around in order to just escape notice when he first got into the fuse box. And he starts doing that, starts going down the, the, the corridor, and uh, he says, when the tide turns rough, beat a retreat. Okay. Uh and a couple of Escudos appear, one from the ceiling, one from the floor, and fucking crush him. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> well, they don't crush him. He's just stuck they in between him. them. Yeah. yeah. And he's like left kicking his legs out behind him, trying to get loose. And oh, who's shown up to save the day, Chris? It's fucking Hughes and Yuma. Each of them use an Escudo to trap him. And uh, they're like, ah, someone was controlling the lights here. Now, shall we earn some points? I'm very this excited for this. It's such, such a cool a, way to end the chapter, honestly. Yeah. It's very exciting. We're like, oh, cool. Like the two attackers on Tomacoma are together. Like, let's see what happens to me. Like, there's so much chaos happening everywhere else. that it's like, oh, I'm super excited for this. Like, it, there's so much going on. And I'm, I'm bummed that we won't keep getting World Trigger once a week. But I'm also super excited to see what, like, a long extension extended chapter of world trigger that's like in a monthly format's gonna feel like mm. so. and it's also a really good way to send us send the series off on this next run because i mean that's such an exciting way to end this point and say hey you know go check it out in the monthly series it's a good way of getting you excited for it mm -hmm. so i'm looking forward to we ha what we have next i'm not sure when we're going to get this next i'm not i don't know if i think that there might be like a a really because if it's it's not going to be at the same time as Boruto, I don't think. I think it's going to be at the same time as Blue Exorcist. It depends, because sometimes I think they'll also hold them back for a little bit on certain weeks. Just so that they don't flood the English jump with all the monthly series in one go. It also depends sometimes on when holidays come in mm -hmm. and things like that. I, 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 I'm not an expert on this, but I don't know if we're getting one next week. Or if we won't get one until two weeks from now, or if it will be really January. Yeah, because we're yeah. we're coming into the month where there's like two weeks off, so uh, we'll we'll see what we get from that. All right, but that's gonna do it, Chris. This is uh, that's our manga for this week. What, what were our favorites? Favorite series and MVP. I'm going to give my favorite series of the week to We Never Learn. I love this chapter of World Trigger, but We Never Learn had a lot of emotion to it that i was really enjoying so i want to give proper credit to that i'm sure there'll be no shortage of weeks where world trigger is still going to get my chapter of the week but I, I did want to give proper credit to that i have to say the same it was a very good uh chapter of uh, we never learn and uh yeah great way of concluding this uh uh unusually long arc between fumino and her father uh, for MVP, I, I guess I'll just give it to Firmino for that same reason. Mm. I'm trying to think if someone else really stuck out more, and I guess she's probably the one who stuck out the most. I consider, like, Blackbeard, but it's like, do you really actually do that much, or am I just, like, so starved for attention? I'm like, Blackbeard did something! He should be MVP! <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give mine to Magma. Uh, I really like the moment of character growth that he demonstrated in this, and, uh, the, uh, just the... It, it, I was it was something that was probably the most unexpected thing that I think happened uh, this week. So. Uh -huh. And uh, that is going to do it for Weekly Manga Recap, guys. Thank you all for joining us here on Smashcast.tv slash RealoT and Twitch.tv slash RealoT. Uh, we record the show normally Thursdays, uh, you starting usually around 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. If uh, we happen to need to change things up, change the time or place, we will let you know. And uh, to stay updated on that stuff, you can follow our Twitter accounts. The official podcast account is at WMR Podcast, and your hosts are at Rillo T and at Nick F Time. 
Also, be sure to check out our past episodes on weeklymongerecap.podbean.com on our YouTube channel and uh, also on iTunes. Be sure to leave a comment, rate, subscribe, all that good stuff. Assist in the algorithm. Help us ascend to the top of the hobby section and dethrone those bastards, the woodworkers. Be sure to send us feedback, ask us questions for our Q&A episodes, and suggest future manga for us to read. You can do that stuff via email to weeklymongerecap at yahoo.com, or you can drop us a line on our Discord channel. And there is a whole thing set up, uh, an entire chat room just for making recommendations and checking out the recommendations that we've already done, uh, as uh, lined out in a spreadsheet prepared by Ninja X3i. Special thanks go out to our Patreon supporters. Your support allows us to create all sorts of fun bonus content for you guys to enjoy, like the Shira episode we recorded last night. And uh, as well, special thanks to Steve Mann, our tower card artist, and Infamous Planet for all the stuff that you do. Absolutely. Um, hmm. Do we have anything we want to end on, Nick? I guess we don't. You know whose fault that is? Yes, I do. It's Hero for his shitty fucking fan service in all of this goddamn series. Plot twist. Next thing you know, Chris... His, the next fetish he introduced into a series will just be a girl wearing nothing but Tai Chi's stupid hat. <laughs> you know what? I think at this point, as long as she doesn't get sold into sex slavery or something like that, I'm all for it at this point. <laughs> It'll be an upgrade. <laughs> like, this, is, this is much better. 